All right, let's give TJ Trippiel a round of applause. <laughs> how you doing? I'm doing well, how are you? How's your girlfriend? Dude, that was, that was a fiasco to say the least. Is she mad? I mean, yeah, it's her birthday next week, and so yeah, she's mad. Yeah, you gotta fix that. Yeah, of yeah. course. Okay, uh, all right, let's, a lot to discuss today, so I'm gonna plow right through everything. Um, so uh, again, a quick reminder, upcoming events, with the now correct dates. So today uh, at 4.30 over Zoom, we're going to have the co-founder of, of Postgres ML. It's basically a, um, it's a modified version of Postgres, or it's not modified, Postgres is not modified. They're building off the extension system and uh, API in Postgres to support uh, machine learning frameworks and large language models directly inside of Postgres. So he's going to talk about the stuff that they've been building. Next week, we have probably the, one of the bigger uh, vector database companies come to give a talk, Weaviate. And then after that, it's uh, going to be feature form. And after feature form, it's feature base, right? Same name, different systems, OK? Again, this is optional. Uh, by all means, uh, attend if you want. Um, and then as I post on Piazza, I'll sending out an email to the database friends, companies like these with everyone's CVs if you if you've uploaded it yesterday, OK? All right. So last class, we talked about hash tables. Uh, and we talked about how there's this, this important data structure that's going to give us this nice O1 average time complexity to do lookups uh, matching keys to values. Um, and we spent time talking about how there is this differentiation between static and dynamic hashing schemes. Uh, like static was you sort of fix size number of slots, whereas the extendable hashing, chained hashing, and uh, linear hashing all had the ability to grow incrementally over time to accommodate more, more keys than you originally envisioned. So the main takeaway from last class should be we spent most of our time talking about how to deal with the conflicts. Right? If, if two keys hash to the two different keys hash to the same location, what do you do? Um, and then we mostly talked about how these hash tables are primarily going to be used in most systems for internal data structures, like your page table in, in, in Project One, right? or the page directory, or the other things keeping track of like what's the state of the of the database system itself while we're running. We'll see hash tables again when we talk about how to do joins efficiently. Um, but again, for the most part, these are primarily used for internal data structures. So today's class, we're now talking about B plus trees. Um, and these are going to be primarily the default choice of when you want to have an index in, in a, a relational database system. So if you call create index, again, 99% of the time in most systems, you'll be getting uh, something that looks like a B plus tree. Then we'll talk about, so we'll go, first go over a high level overview of what a B plus tree looks like, uh, what makes it, a, the, what's the plus in B plus tree versus regular B-tree. Um, and then we'll talk about some basic design choices of how when we actually want to build one. And then we'll finish up to the, to, to the time we have, uh, to the extent that we have time at the end, talk about all the different ways you can actually optimize and, and, and improve performance of these different systems. And the examples of what real systems are actually, actually doing today. OK? All right, so the first thing we've got to discuss is like, what is a B plus tree? And so the B plus tree is in a sort of category of data structures called B trees. And what's sort of confusing about this in the database literature or in different database systems is that there's the class of the data structure called B trees, and then there's a specific data structure called a B tree. And then some database systems are actually using B plus trees, but they're going to call themselves a B tree. Right? So if you go look at the Postgres code, they're going to refer to their data structure as a B tree. But as far as I can tell, it's a B plus tree with some modern techniques like from the B link tree. Right? So it's sort of this, when, B, when you say B plus tree, the, the, it's typically going to mean a, a bunch of these other different things. So the, there is no original paper on the B plus tree. Or actually, well, the, the one that everyone cites is this one from 1979 uh, by the guys at IBM talking about the, what they call the ubiquitous B, B tree. And in this, they describe, hey, there's this di the different variants. But the most common one that's going to be most useful for our database systems is going to be a B plus tree. And then they cite some kind of IBM tech report that I have not been able to find. Uh, I didn't look that hard, but like it, it doesn't show up right away on Google. Um, that, that's the one where they talk about the, the, the original B plus tree. Um, the original authors of what the, of, of, of the B plus tree work, uh, this guy, Bayer and the Crayot, they never actually define what the B means um, in B plus tree. Typically, people say it's, it's for balanced, um, broad, bushy. The guy's name is Bayer, B-A-E-Y-E-R, so he could, could have named it after himself. Um, it, this data structure actually developed at Boeing, 
like the airplane companies, could have, could have, so it could have been Boeing tree. Uh, nobody really knows, but typically people, when you say beef tree, people typically mean balanced. There's another variant called B-link tree. Um, and as I said, there'll be the sort of classic B plus tree, but nobody implements exactly as it's defined there. People are going to borrow bits and pieces of it. And in particular, what they're going to borrow is some ideas from this B-link tree paper that actually came from here at CMU in, in 1981. Uh, it's written this guy by Phil Lehman. That dude still works in the dean's office at CMU uh, on the fifth floor. And if you go look at the Postgres source code uh, in the, the, the directory where they talk about their beep tree, notice they say B tree instead of B plus tree. And they say is it NB tree because it's a non-balanced B plus tree. But we'll get to that later. Um, but yeah, right here in the source code, they say, oh yeah, this is a correct implementation. Correct is always important. Of a Lehman and Yao's paper from the B link tree from 1973. Right? So that's kind of cool. Um, but again, we're going to focus primarily on this one. We'll see if we have time. I'll talk about the B epsilon tree at the end. And then the BW tree is a thing out of Microsoft. It's a lock-free version of a B plus tree. Um, we actually implemented that here at CMU, and it was not easy. Um, and we have an open source implementation of that. OK. So the B plus tree is going to be a self-balanced order tree that's going to allow us to do searches and sequential access and insertions and deletions all in log n time. Right? Because log n is going to be the, the height of the tree. And so the, the, the difference between what we'll describe here in a B plus tree versus a sort of generic binary search tree is that the nodes in our data structure can have obviously more than two, uh, two keys. And the reason why we're going to want this is because, again, we want to convert, we want to minimize the amount of random I.O. we're doing. So we want to maximize the amount of sequential I.O. And the B plus tree is going to be perfect for us to do this. Because when we land in a node that's essentially fetching in a page, and we don't have we don't have as many keys as we can inside that, before we have to go move on to grab the next piece of uh, next page from disk, All right? So again, thinking back way back in like the 1970s when hardware was terrible, uh, like the you had a minimal amount of RAM, your, but your disk was also super slow. So a B plus tree is going to allow you to convert when you do these lookups and from from random I/O into uh, sequential access. Right, because we're so you to follow the leaf nodes, or sorry, follow the, 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 the tree down to the leaf nodes, and once you're down there, you never go back up. Not entirely true, but for our purposes now, we'll, we'll assume that's the case. And then I can scan along the leaf nodes to find the data I'm looking for. Right? So, more formally, we could say that a B plus tree is going to be an M way search tree uh, with the following properties. First is that it's going to be perfectly balanced, meaning that the Every leaf node in our tree structure is going to have the same depth. It means it's going to be the same number of levels down from the root to that, that leaf node. And again, Postgres is going to violate this a little bit. Some, some people do. But for, for the very beginning, assume that's the case. We also have a rule that every node other than the root has to be at least half full. So if I, if I can have m keys in, my, in, my, in, my, in a node, I need to have at least half half the number of nodes, half the number of keys as possible up to the, the maximum number, right? And if I go below that threshold, if I go below being less than half full, that, then I'll, I have to do some merging. But again, we, we, can, we, can, we can tweak that requirement later on. And so then the, the root would be special case, so we, we, we can ignore it for now. Um, and then every inner node with at least k keys is going to have at least k plus one non-null children. Meaning, I could have some uh, locations where I could, or pointer, possible pointers to, to leaf nodes uh, or nodes below me when I'm an inner node, but I don't have to have the max number. So, this is all math. Let's look at an example. So, here's a really simple, uh, uh, here's a really simple, like two way B plus tree. Um, and we can define the root node at the top, and then the inner nodes are just because we only have three levels, the inner nodes are just the ones in the middle. And then the leaf nodes are the things at the bottom. So within a node itself, we're going to have this sort of alternating uh, pattern between a pointer to another node and then a key. And then in the leaf nodes, there'll be the value that we're trying to store for this for, for a given key. And for now, we're not going to define what the value is, but you can think of it like potentially the record ID to point to the actual tuple or some page number, uh, page number and offset. Uh, or if it's a case of like MySQL or SQLite, it could actually be the tuple itself. But for now, we can ignore that. 
And so the way to think about these, these numbers here in the inner nodes and the root nodes, that these are essentially guideposts that tell you which path you want to go down. Right? So at the root node here, we only have one key. It's 20. So if you're going to go left to it, it's any, value that's going to, any key value that's going to be less than 20. And then we go right to for a greater than or equal to. Right? Same thing with the next one. Uh, I have 10 here. Uh, less than 10 goes here. Greater than or equal to 10 goes on the other side. So what makes, uh, so this is sort of what I'm describing so far. This is a basic B plus tree. But what I was saying before that they have this, uh, we're borrowing ideas from other papers like the B link tree, is that the nodes are also going to have sibling pointers at every level. So I think the textbook might only show them at the leaf nodes. Postgres puts them in the middle node, uh, the inner nodes as well. And I think the original B link paper had them at the inner nodes as well. And so the reason why this matters is, again, if I'm doing a search, like give me all the keys greater than or equal to six, I could traverse down the, you know, this side of the tree, get to the bottom, and now I can rip through along the leaf nodes and never have to go go back up. We won't talk about multi-threading just yet, but like, like the having to get parent lock or latches on your parents in order to scan along, that's gonna be expensive. If I can just keep down at the lowest level I need to go, then I can I can move more quickly. And again, if it's random I.O., this sucks. But if I get down here, assuming all these pages are sequentially or contiguous on each other on disk, then that's all sequential I.O. to scan across. Yes? So what's the point of having them in the inner nodes? Yeah, it's point is, what's the point of having these in, in the inner nodes? It helps you when you do splits and merges. Right? If I know I have to, like, if I want to steal something, so say, like, I, if I delete 10, say 10 gets deleted, instead of having to, uh, Reorganize the entire tree. I could follow the simply pointer, maybe take a key from this guy and bring it over. Yes? What exactly is a node pointer in this question? I didn't quite catch it. What, uh, what is quite, his question is what is exactly a node pointer? Yeah. Like, uh, like, what, like these red lines? No, not the sibling pointers, the node pointer at the top. Oh, oh, oh. So the node pointer would be like, so I'll show the next slide. You're not going to lay this out exactly. You wouldn't lay this out in a disk exactly I'm describing, but the thing of it is, like, I have the, the key here, 20. So that's this part. And then the node pointer is saying, if, any, if you're looking for a key that's less than 20, follow this pointer, and you go down here and find it. Right. And in, in, an, in our world, in a database system that's on disk, it's just a page ID. But we also have to store the pointer to the other side, right? Correct, yes. Ah, OK, OK. Yeah, so right. just trying, yeah, this is the visualization people usually, usually show. All right, so the, the nodes themselves are going to be basically a, a, a Arrays of key value pairs. Uh, and the, the, again, the keys are going to be derived from whatever the attribute that the index is based on from the table. So I say I build an index on table foo, columns ABC. The key itself will be copies of the values for every single tuple in ABC. So you can sort of think the index is like a replica of the table that you're, that you're trying to index. And it's, it's organized in such a way, in an ordered manner, to allow you to do these efficient, efficient log and lookups. Right? In the relational model, the tables are, could potentially be unsorted. We'll violate that in, in a few more slides. But like, the table could be unsorted. And so this index is a way to have sort, uh, you know, fast sorted access. And of course, now underneath the covers, the database system, and we'll see this later in the semester, has to make sure that your index is in sync with the table. Right? Meaning if I, if I update or I insert a tuple into my table, I want to make, automatically update my indexes. And the database system will do this for you and make sure everything is consistent and in sync. But again, we won't focus on that in this class. The, uh, the values can differ depending on where they are. Sorry, the values will differ depending on where the inner node or leaf node. If it's inner node, the value is a pointer to some page below us. If it's the leaf node, then it's going to be either, again, the, uh, the pointer to the tuple. I'm using the pointer not in the memory address term. I'm meaning, like, again, page ID off software, the record ID. Or it could be the actual tuple itself. The arrays within the nodes themselves are typically kept in sorted order, but they don't have to be. Um, and then there's this issue of how do you deal with null keys, right? Because again, assume that if, if the index are trying to build, you, the index are trying to build using a B plus tree, if, it, if it's non-unique, there could be null values. We have to put the null somewhere. So typically, you either put them all at the end or all, all at the beginning. And actually, when you create indexes in some systems, you actually define where you want them. Do you want to be first or after? Because depending on what your query is, you may want to not see the nulls first. You may want to see them at the end. Um, again, it depends on applications. Another important thing also, too, is that the, 
but going back here, th there's only sibling pointers and pointers going down. There's no pointers going back up. And the reason is why, and we'll see this more in the next class, is when we start taking latches on these nodes, uh, we don't want to have one thread going this way, you know, from the top down, another thread going from the bottom top, because that's going to have deadlocks. Now the sibling pointers are going to have this issue too, and we'll see how to handle that. But by avoiding having the pointers going in two directions between different levels, it's one less thing we have to worry about. Because right? we don't need, in the way we're going to do splits and merges, it's not like an AVL tree where you have to do like, rotations and all that. We're, we're, we're not going to do any of that. Some may say it's, it's easier. Not, not really. Um, they, both, they both suck, both hard. All right, so here's what, I, again, our node looks like. Again, somewhere in the, assuming this is a page, right? So we're going to have the, this array of key value pointers. I'm sorry, keys and values, and then we'll have these these pointers here um, that'll go to that'll be just a page ID to the previous one and to the next one along 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 the our level. The key value pairs could either be sorted uh, one after another. If it's a uh, if it's a inner node, then the, the 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 values would just be pointers again record IDs. Um, we could also sort them separately. Uh, and this is probably the most common approach. You would have the, the keys sorted in one array, and then the values sorted separately in another array. And then the, whatever offset you are in the, in, the, you know, in the key array, that corresponds to some offset in the, in the value array. It's almost like the column store stuff we said before. You can do simple arithmetic to decide how to jump around. Varchars mess that up, but you, also, you just maintain an offset table to keep, keep track of these things. Right? So that's a, and then there's additional metadata you can keep track of, like, Here's the number of slots I have left in my, in my page. Like what, level, uh, you know, what, what level am I looking at? And that way, as you're traversing down, you can just look in the page and say, okay, wh wh what, where am I in the tree? Um, it's also useful, useful for recovery as well. So I've already said this. I'm just repeating myself. But the, 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 the leaf node values themselves could either be record IDs, which is just page number and offset to some location. And then the or could be a tuple data, as in the case of in index organized storage, when we talked about before, like SQLite and MySQL do this by default. But in like SQL Server and Oracle, you can say create table, and I want it to be index organized, right? And it'll it'll, it'll make the it'll make a B plus tree, and then the leaf nodes will be the actual just tuples themselves. All right? You can, for the number two, you only do this for the uh, the primary key index. Otherwise, you're you're duplicating data. You don't, you don't want to do that. Yes. I just want to clarify some. If yes. The question is, if, if it's storing record IDs, is it a leaf node or an inner node? It's a leaf node. Because okay. again, like, I don't have, we'll, we'll bring up an example in a second, but like, coming back here, the, the only really keys that exist that like that actually correspond to what's actually in your table are found in the leaf nodes. So we'll see this in our, in our demo when we like delete and insert keys. They, the, a key that was deleted may actually still exist in, in an inner node, right? So you can't have it, like, you couldn't have it be a record ID to point to something because th that, that record may not exist. Right? In this case here, I have in this inner node here, I have 35, but there's no 35 in the leaf node, meaning at some point this key got 35 inserted into it and then got deleted. But because the way it, it got organized in, in the algorithm to maintain the balance of the, of the tree, I didn't end up removing 35. So it's still there. So the thing of like all the inner nodes are just guideposts, or, you know, or traffic signs or street signs to tell you how to get down to where you need to go in, in the leaves. Yes? Is it true to say that every inner node only has one key, but every leaf node has, can have multiple keys? Uh -huh. His statement is, is it true to say that every inner node has one key but every leaf node can have multiple keys. So th this example here, I'm showing two keys per node because i got to make it fit on PowerPoint, right? Uh, there's nothing about the B plus tree that says you can only have two, key two keys. You can have multiple keys. Yeah, uh, but for inner nodes, what's the point to have two keys? Because you can only have two. Uh, you only need to make one comparison. Right? In, in this example? In this example, yeah, you only need one. But... In a, in a real B plus tree, you wouldn't have one key per index, per, per node, right? Well, because you, you can have more than two. Total you can have unlimited, right? Yeah. And this, actually, and we'll get this in a second. The slower the disk, actually, the bigger the, the node you want, because that's more sequential I.O. So actually, you could have hundreds of keys. Yeah, there's a limitation on what I can show in PowerPoint, um, but we'll bring up the demo in a second. Other questions? 
Okay, so I made a big deal of like, okay, we're talking about B plus trees, not B trees. You may not know what a B tree is. So the original B tree from 1972 had all the keys and values stored all throughout the tree, sort of like an AVL tree, for example. Um, and it's more space efficient because you never have keys that are that don't correspond to actually anything, something in your data set. Like I said before, I could delete record 35, key 35, and I get over, it'll get removed from the leaf nodes, but it may end up still in, in one of the guideposts. Or I could have multiple copies of the key going down my, my inner nodes to the leaf node, and you know, that's potentially wasting data or wasting space. So in a B tree, a key only appears once anywhere in the entire tree. Uh, but the problem with that one is that the, the values, I mean, the, so like the record ID is pointing to the actual tuples, they can be anywhere in the tree. And so now if I want to scan along sequentially to get all the keys ID in, in, in sort of order, I may have to traverse up, up and down because I basically have to do breadth first search, right? And again, we're not going to talk about latching just yet, but think of like I basically have to latch the entire tree as I'm going up and down. Whereas in a B plus tree, because the leaf nodes are only places where values actually are, right? Consider like that's the, the exact copy of what's in the table. Once I get to the leaf nodes, I don't have to maintain any of the latches from upper parts in the tree, and I can just scan along the leaf, you know, leaves and let other threads do whatever they want at the, at the top, up above, as long as it doesn't need for what I'm doing, right? So the advantage for a B plus tree over a, uh, a B tree is that we're going to have better concurrent access, and we're, again, we're going to maximize or, or, or improve our, the amount of sequential I.O. we're doing over random I.O. Yes? This question is, if, if the... If the inner nodes only are only guideposts, why do we have uh, why do we have sibling pointers? Because when you're doing split and merges, you may need to to borrow things or merge with your neighbor, and they may they, and they may be you know you have the same parent instead of going back to the parent, you can go across and get them. You don't need it; it's just an optimization. Postgres does it. I actually don't know. I don't know whether MySQL does. Okay. So let's see how we want to do our basic operations. Uh, so do an insert. We want to basically the goal is to find the correct leaf node. So uh, we're going to basically traverse down, following the guidepost, get to some leaf node where our, where our key should be. Uh, and if it has enough space, great. We insert it in sorted order in, in that leaf node, and we're done. If there's not enough space, uh, meaning the, the, the keys are f the number of keys we have is full in the node, then we're gonna have to split whatever the, the leaf node we're trying to insert into into two nodes, divide it in half, put half the keys go on one side, half the keys go on the other side, and then you're gonna copy up whatever the middle key is between in, the, in that list of keys up to your parent, and then now you have a new 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 guidepost and a new pointer down to the new the new node you just created, the new leaf node. And of course, this happens recursively, right? If I, if I, if I promote up uh, the middle key that I split on to the parent, and that parent is full, well, now I got to split the parent, and that can that can cascade all the way to the top. So, making you know making these slides show this in in um, in, uh, in PowerPoint is kind of a pain. So, I'm gonna do I'm gonna bring up this visualization. So this is a uh, Bring it up here. Yeah, let's shrink the size. Here we go. All right, so this is a website. Uh, the, the, again, the link on the the link on the slides takes you to the wrong one. Uh, the, the, uh, I'll have to update it. But look, it's uh, if you if you search B plus tree visualization, you'll get this. Um, so I'm going to do a uh, a demo of a B plus tree with degree two. So the maximum number of keys per node is two, and maximum number of pointers is going to be three. Um, so the first thing we'll do, we're going to insert two. That lands in our root node. Ah, can I make that bigger? Let's try this. Uh, height 200, and then now I can maybe do this. Is that better? OK. All right, so then we're going to insert six, right? So again, our, our, this, we only have a root node. It can hold two keys, so no, nothing changes here. So now we're going to insert four. So in this case here, 
We try to put three keys in our root, we can't do that. So it decides to split on four, makes two new, two new leaf nodes, uh, and, does, and then the middle key is four. So anything uh, less than four goes on this side, greater than equal to four goes on the other side. So two is on this node over here, this leaf node, and then the uh, four and eight go on the other side. And then in this implementation, they only have the sibling pointer go in one direction. Some systems do that. Postgres does both directions. So again, it's not wrong, it's just, it's, it's just done differently. So now I insert five, right? So I follow four. Four is less than, so five is greater than, greater than equal to four. So it would go down to the previous node, but then I, have, I had two keys already in there, so I had to split that key and uh, split that leaf node. I made two nodes, and then I, I put five up there. OK? So far, so good? OK. So delete is essentially the reverse of this, um, where we start at the root, go down till we find the leaf node where our entry, uh, the entry went removed. If it's not there, then we don't do anything, right? Because you can't delete a key that doesn't exist. Um, if it is there, then we go ahead and delete it. So if the leaf node we just modified is at least half full, then we're done, right? We, we pop out and we don't have to do anything. But now if, but if the leaf node, after deleting that key, goes below our threshold, right, m, m divided by 2 minus 1, um, where m is the number of keys per node, then we have to redistribute. Or Sorry, the first thing we just try to do is redistribute, meaning follow the sibling pointers, find a, a, another node at the same level as us, and steal one of their keys. Like, as long as they don't become unbalanced, that's OK. We may have to tweak up above uh, the parent node. Um, sorry, in the parent node, the, 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 the guidepost, the split point. Um, but again, that's, it's not that expensive, because we would already have the latch for it, which we'll cover next time. Um, if we can't redistribute, then we have to merge L with one of its siblings, combine those two keys, put it together, and then update the, the parent accordingly. Right? And again, this, this is recursive. So if, like, if I merge two, two nodes together, and then I delete a guidepost key in my parent, and now the parent is less than half full, then I, that, the, the merge will cascade up. Yes? What does a redistribution fail look like? What does it fail? Like if I, if, uh, I have two keys, you have one key, and you're my, you're my sibling. I delete a key, and I'm less than half full. Right, that's a bad example, because there's, say, three keys. right? Uh, if you have two keys, and I have two keys, I delete a key, and I'm like, oh, I'm less than half full, and I go try to steal one of your keys. But if, you, if I do that to you, then you're less than half full, so I can't. All right, so let's go back to our demo. All right, so we can go ahead and delete. So let's go ahead and delete eight. Right, eight's at the far end here. Oh, it was, it was six. Oh, yeah, sorry. Six, right? Goes over here, delete six. That's fine. We're still balanced. Again, it's it's two keys per per two keys per node. I have to be half full. In this case, it's one. Um, we can go to we can go to degree uh, four if that looks better. But now, say I, I delete key four in the middle. Right, it basically re propagates up and removes it from, from above. So let's go to degree four because then you can start seeing the stealing better. So let's do the same thing. So let's do insert one. Insert two. Four, five, throw split. Now we got there. Six, eight, All right, and then we'll do, we'll do nine. All right, so we're going to go ahead and delete five, five in the middle here, and again, and at this point here, the, this node, this leaf node, will become less than half full. So the first thing it's going to try to do is try to steal from from uh, from one of its siblings. So let's go ahead and delete five. Didn't do that. Why not? Yeah, this. I, what's that? Yeah, I think it's a four. So I delete four. Let's see what it does. Yeah, there it goes. There, there it steals. Yeah, so this animation doesn't follow the textbook exactly. Um, now, but like, it, it's not wrong. It's just like different ways to do things. Like, it, you know, how aggressive you want to be on certain optimizations. But as long as you get the high level idea that you could steal. Um, 
but you still have to update the parent when you steal because that, that's going to change the boundary points. Yes? I'm seeing in this, in this uh, visualization that it looks like there's only pointers to the next node instead of like both ways. Yes. So as I said, like in this example here, they have sibling pointers going one direction. Postgres and other systems go in both directions. Doubly linked list. Yeah. Yes? So you said that siblings are adjacent nodes with the same parent. I was wondering if sibling pointers point to adjacent nodes that have different parents. Yeah, his question is, um, actually, I had, I had an example of that. Actually, that's a good question. I, yeah, actually, no, I don't have an example of that. Well, I know I do, like in the middle here. Um, these guys, I, yeah, so I think for leaf nodes, you definitely want pointers to your siblings along this because you, you, you need to be able to go along the leaf nodes. Uh, if this guy had, like, a, you know, this thing got even bigger, could you have two parents, could two, two, two nodes at the same level have pointers to each other even though they don't, you know, don't have the same parent? You could. I don't know. Actually, don't. I don't know what Postgres does or other systems do. Yes. Yeah. To this point, you, you may not. Mm, sorry. If you have the same parent, or so if you have the same parent. Uh, sorry. No. If you have a different parent, then you don't need to have a sibling pointer because you're always going to merge with the. I mean, everyone. Oh, everyone comes up to the root. Like so, like. It may be the case you have to like reorganize everything, right? So you, that may help. But at that point, you're, you're latching the whole tree, so who cares? Um, yes? Uh, you said you don't store the parent pointer. How do you send the data back to the parent? This question is, if you, don't st send, if you don't store a pointer to the parent, how do you send data to the parent? We'll, we will discuss this next class because basically as you're going down, you keep track of the stack of, of the nodes you visit as you go down. And you keep track of which ones you had the latch for. So I can go down, like if I'm traversing down like here, and say, and this guy here, I, I have to, I got to split. When I when I come down uh, and get here, I would recognize, hey, I'm going to have to split. Don't release the latch my parent. So I still have a pointer. I still have it on my stack. I can get back to. So it's the internal bookkeeping of the worker as it goes down the threads, or go, goes down the tree. Yes, again. And then so the, the, we'll, again, we'll talk about what it means to be safe versus unsafe traversals. Like you know, like as you go down, if you would know, like I'm, I'm trying to delete something. So as I go down, if I know that no matter whether or not the key I need, need below me, whether I, it's there or not, I know that there, I won't have to do a merge or split on this node I'm at right now. So once I go past it, I, don't, I can release the latch on it because it's considered safe. It won't, no matter what happens below you, it'll never get reorganized. So you don't need to maintain the latch work. That we'll cover next class. OK. All right, so that's the basic operations for uh, splits and merges. Um, so the B plus tree, has, or just trees in general, but B plus tree from B plus in, in databases, is going to have a bunch of, do a bunch of other stuff we, can, we, we, couldn't be able, we couldn't do with a hash table. So we have, in a hash table, the only operation we could do is something equals this key, right? Is the, is the hash key equal to my, to my key that I'm looking up on? We can't do less than, we can't do greater than, and we can't do any partial key lookups. So you have to have the entire key, right? So if I say I build an index on columns A, B, C, I, if I only have columns in A and B for my key, I can't hash that and jump to anything meaningful, right? Because the hash is completely, completely random. But in a B plus tree, we can do a bunch of tricks where we can potentially only have, or actually, not potentially, you can. You can only have parts of the key, uh, or, or a certain number of the attributes that, that your key is based on, and still use it for, for queries. So again, say they index on ABC. So obviously, I can do uh, A equals 1, or B equals 2, and C equals 3. That's the same thing as the hash thing. I have the quality matching for all of the keys that are in my, that, that the index is based on. I also can do what's called a prefix search where I only have A and B and not C, right? And we can do the, the lookups to find all the matches were for, based on the A and B without C. Uh, but we'd also, not all systems do this, because it's, it's trickier to do. We also can do uh, a, a, a suffix lookup where we don't have the prefix, we have, but we have the, the, the suffix of the keys. So I don't have A, but I have B and C, and I can potentially still use my index and do that lookup. 
Very few systems do this. This is hard. Postgres doesn't do this. Uh, the Oracle and I think maybe SQL Server can do this, right? And again, if it was a hash index, we have to have the entire key, and we and it always have to be an equality predicate. Yes. So people don't do this because it's hard to it's hard it's because it's hard to implement. It's hard to implement. Yes. Right. Yeah. Because you basically need to have like potentially multiple threads at the same time going down and everyone everyone coordinating. There might be a patent from Oracle, and that prevents people from doing this. It wouldn't surprise me. I don't know. They're called skip scans in Oracle, um, and that, that might be why nobody, does, nobody else does this. All right, so again, say I have my, my index on A and B. If I want to find key one and two, uh, again, I use my guideposts, and essentially just looking at the keys, the, the parts of the key in, in sort of sequential order. So first I check is one less than, less than equal to one, and then I check the second part is two less than equal to three, and that tells me that I want to follow down this to this, this node here, and then I can find the entry I'm looking for. If I'm doing a prefix search, meaning I have the first part of the key, but not the remaining part, so I, I, have, the, I have key on A, but not, not B, uh, the way that would work is you basically look at the part that you do have and say, is one less than equal to one? Yes, follow down here. And then now I scan along and keep keep evaluating my predicate against the, all the keys that are, in, that are in the leaf nodes until I have something that violates uh, or I, where I know that one is now is, is less than two and I, I, can't, I can't traverse here. Because it's in sorted order, I know there'll be never, never anything where, you know, with a key, the first part A equals one and then something else for B after this point because they're sorted first on, on the, 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 the first part of the key. Again, the last one for the skip scans, Basically, what happens is you, at every single node, you, you evaluate, okay, what part of the key do I have, and then determine what portion of the, the trees below you have to look at. And this example here, since I don't have the, the first part of the key, I essentially have to look at everything. And again, in, I think in Oracle, they can have multiple threads in parallel go down different parts of the tree, and then they combine the results together at, at the end. It's almost like doing a wildcard search. And so, we, we'll see this a little bit with the demo at the end. There's this trade-off between in the data system is going to make that like it could say, all right, well, I know something about the statistics of, of the keys that my index is based on, so it probably still is worth me to go look look in the key look in the index. But it may decide, okay, well, I don't know anything about what you're trying to ask me to do, so I'm not, the index is not going to help me. I'm just going to do a sequential scan across the entire table, and that actually may be faster than trying to pr do multiple probes down on the index and combine results together. And again, it's not something the programmer has to deal with. This is something we, we take the SQL query and try to figure this out on our, on our own. Again, and we'll cover this uh, after the midterm. Yes? Is it up to the programmer to decide which indexes to make? So this question is, well, okay. This question is, is it up to the programmer to decide what indexes to make? Most systems, yes. So this is, uh, this is an old problem in databases, right? I talk about how great the, the abstraction is, relational model, that like, you don't have to worry about how things are actually physically stored and all that. But at the end of the day, someone's got to decide what indexes you actually need. And so there's a long line of research, uh, myself here at CMU, but like going back to the 1970s of people trying to figure out automatically what indexes you need. Uh, and so the commercial systems have built-in tools that can help you figure this out. My SQL and Postgres do not have that. Postgres will build whatever indexes you, t you tell it you want. It'll just do it for you. Right? So you want to if you tell it I want a thousand indexes, it'll do it. Right? In um, in SQL Server on on Azure, what they will actually do is they'll spin up a separate instance for your database system, try out basically some kind of machine learning algorithm to figure out what indexes you actually need, and then suggest them to you. Right? SQL Server does other other interesting things too. Well, they'll in the query optimizer, uh, which we'll t again talk about after midterm. Your query shows up, it starts planning it based on whatever indexes you have. But at some point, you can also say, man, I'd be really great if I had, a, if I had an index on this tree, on this table right now. It doesn't, it can build it for you, if you potentially, but it, instead of saying, it can potentially build it for you just for that query, but it also come back and tell you, hey, by the way, if you gave me this index, I'd run a lot faster. The reason why you may necessarily, you know, you, you could build it just for the query and then throw it away, because that'll only affect that query. You may not want to build it and then keep it around because, as I said, you got to maintain it and you got to keep it in sync with the table. So you don't want your database to start adding like a ton of indexes, and now that's going to make all my insert updates and leads go slower. Also, too, like you know, they take storage space, they take memory space. So like, there's a cost of physical hardware as well. 
that's a whole other uh, hornet's nest we can get into. Okay. All right, so the next thing we've got to deal with is, all right, so at this point, we know how to do inserts, updates, deletes. Or sorry, we know how to do inserts and deletes. We know how to do basic lookups to find the keys we're looking for, whether prefix searches, full key searches, or the skip scans. The next challenge we've got to deal with is how do we handle duplicate keys? So there's two approaches to, doing, to do this. Again, the, the issue is going to be, like, since I want to be able to uh, have everything always in log n, Right? How do I actually want to handle the, the have the capability of inserting keys, uh, duplicate keys over and over again, and not violate that that requirement? So the most common approach is to to maintain sort of a hidden column or hidden attribute in the key with the record ID of the tuple that it's pointing to, and then that guarantees that every key ends up being unique. Right? If you have a key on four and I have a key on four. But you have a separate tuple and I have a separate tuple. If we put our, our basic our record ID as part of the key, in addition to the column we're in, based on their index, then your four and my four end up being unique. And because I can do that prefix search, where I don't have to have all the elements of the key to do lookups, then this, this scheme still works. The other approach is do overflow, overflow leaf nodes. And basic idea is that. The, the leaf nodes themselves, if I, if I get too full, but I know I'm inserting the same key, then I just potentially keep building a linked list. And I sort of go down uh, in, in the depth of the tree. Again, but that violates our, our log n approach, our log, log n guarantee. All right, so, here, so here's how we do the, append, the, the record. Right? So the key now isn't just the number one. It's one and then followed by the record ID, again, which is the page number and offset. So now if I want to insert 6, and 6 already exists, well, any time, you know, even though you might call in SQL insert 6, what the database system is going to do is convert that to insert 6 followed by the page number uh, and, and slot number. So now when I get down here, uh, since this guy is full, uh, I'll, just, I'll just do a split, things slide over, uh, and then, oops, sorry. Yeah, wrong one. So I do, things slide over, and then now I can insert uh, six right here, right? And again, superficially, this looks like it's duplicate keys, but again, the, the actual bits themselves are, are unique. So of course, now if I want if I want to do a delete on six, again, I would have to you know the, the, internally the data system is going to know okay, well, delete on six followed by this record ID and offset, or the the, the page number and offset. Yes. The question is, what happens if the key is not a number? Yeah. What do you mean? Because like, you're inserting, like, is 6 the actual record or the key? Oh, so, my, so yeah, so 6 is the key. Oh, OK. So then, wait, so then what are you in? How like, does, what, does the database know to insert 6 specifically? Because uh, I insert into a table, right? And the table has an has a, has a index on column foo, column A. And the, the tuple I'm inserting for that attribute sets the value to 6. Oh. Right? But instead of just putting six in, it's going to say, all right, I've already inserted into the table. Now I have a record ID. So when I insert into the index, it's the six appended by the bits for the record ID. And that guarantees that no many times I insert six, it's unique. right? Now, if, uh, if it's a unique index, so I, cause I, like a primary key index, so I can declare that it's a unique index, then I don't want to do this. But this still, this, the mechanism still works. Yes? The statement is, uh, and he's correct, that this is, this is just essentially a hidden attribute uh, that guarantees that, that duplicate keys are, 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 are physically unique right? because it's the record ID. Yes, that's the trick. Thank you. Yep. All right, so the overflow nodes, the overflow node, leaf nodes look like this. I insert six. I recognize it's, it's full uh, in, in my leaf node, but I also recognize that the thing you're trying to insert already exists in here, and therefore it's a duplicate. So I just make this overflow page and insert it down here. All right? And I can keep inserting new things, and I keep appending it along like this. So this looks sort of similar to the, the, the chain hash table before, right? That like, instead of having a hash function tell me what, where I land at the start of my linked list, I have a tree structure in front of it, but essentially doing the, the same thing. 
But of course, now again, the you know this violates the law again. We have to deal with like, okay, what if we actually want to split and merge? What do we move things? Th this makes things way more complicated than the record ID approach, and a very. I don't think any real system actually does this. Yes. The question is, why, what's the benefit of this approach? Well, now I don't need to store the record ID, oh, yeah. right? Uh, duplicate, you know, with the, the, it's stored a part in every single key. Um, it's potentially easier, easier engineering. Actually, not really. It makes it harder. This is, this is, yeah, this is a bad idea. Don't do this. <laughs> but you could. And some of you will have. I'm just saying it's bad. All right. I basically want to talk about cluster indexes. These aren't, I mean, it's good for you guys to at least know this and this exists, but I don't want to spend too much time on it. The basic idea is that there's some database systems that let you define what are called clustered indexes on tables, um, where you, you can allow a, the, the actual table itself, the actual tuples themselves, even though the relational model is unsorted, you can say, I want the physical tuples on disk to be sorted based on the sort order defined by some index. And in this case here, if I, if I have a true clustered index, um, that no matter where I insert a new record, the, 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 the actual heap files themselves will be guaranteed to be in, in that sort of order. You can sort of think of this, like, again, the, the, the MySQL SQLite approach where the leaf nodes are actually storing the tuples, that's automatically a clustered index. But in some database systems where it isn't uh, an in-organized table, you can have the, the sorter be enforced by, by this kind of index. Right, and so the the advantage of this is that when I start doing uh, when I want to start doing scans, um, assuming I'm not doing index organized storage, when I scan along the leaf nodes to find all the tuples I'm looking for, then I'm guaranteed to get the the pages in sorted order based defined on the key order. Right, so again, as as I as I scan this going across. I get, I get all my entries and I get all my pages and I just rip through that sequentially and things go fast. If you don't have a cluster index, then you, you end up sometimes with a bunch of random I.O. The, again, the, the leaf nodes, that could be stored sequentially on disk. But when I start doing lookups to get the actual data that the, the leaf nodes are pointing to, that could end up being random. Right? And so if I do something really stupid, like say I have one free frame in my buffer pool and if I scan along in the order, uh, if I fetch the page in the order that they come out of the index, I may end up doing a bunch of the uh, redundant I.O. where like, I fetch a page in, process on it, because that's the key I'm looking at right now or the, that, I, that I got pointed to, and then I throw it away, get the next page, but then a few, few more keys later, I go fetch the same page I did before. So a really simple optimization to do this is that you don't actually you don't retrieve the tuples as, as you scan along the leaf nodes, right, as you find them. You first do the, the scan of the leaf nodes first, get your list of all your pages, then sort them in, uh, by page, based on page ID, and then go retrieve them based on this. Now, you still have to do the bookkeeping to make sure that you, you, you're following along the tuples in the order defined by the index, if that's, that's what you care about. But again, this is a way to get more sequential I.O. and reduce the amount of, amount of random access. Yes? And so, so his, his statement is, why can't I just keep track of what I've already fetched in page? I don't fetch it again. I was giving like a toy example where like I only have one frame, so like I can only fetch one page. I throw it out and get the next page, in this in this toy example, right? I see. So, but but think in a real system, you know, don't think of like one page. Think of like I can have maybe, you know, ten gigabytes of space, but my database is one terabyte. The table is one terabyte, and then so, you know you're running out of space. You you want to sort them. You want to give them page. You want to, you want to access them in the order that they exist physically on disk, and then still do a bit, just bookkeeping to make sure that the order of the results you're generating match the sort order of the of the index. Again, to, re to reduce the amount of wasted I/O. Okay, so I want to quickly go through some some design choices here. Um, how to handle certain things. And so a lot of these, these ideas come from this book, which is considered the Bible of B plus trees, um, from this guy, Gertz Graffy. Uh, he's invented a bunch of the various techniques that we'll discuss throughout the semester. Um, and again, he, it's called modern B, B tree techniques. And again, he's talking about B plus trees, but he calls it a B tree. Um, 
And actually, if you just Google this name of this book, it came out in 2010. It's a great book. covers a lot of these techniques and, and even more. Uh, uh, if you just Google, you'll find the PDF. Um, if, you, if you like this kind of stuff, it's, it's a good read. Again, because it's not like th theory. It's like, here's how actually how to implement it in a real system. All right, so the first question is, what's going to be the node size? So you can assume in all our diagrams here, one node corresponds to one page uh, in, in, you know, in, in, our, in our database files, in, in our buffer pool. Um, but in some systems, like in IBM DB2, you can actually modify, you can configure the size of a database page for different tables and different indexes. And so depending on what your hardware is, you may want to set the size, the page size of your, your, your B plus G nodes differently. And so again, the, lar the slower your disk, typically the larger the page you want because, again, it's going to be better for, for maximizing sequential I.O. So if you're an old, an old spinning disk hard drive, you want a page size of like one megabyte. Now the number of keys will be, that you can fit on a one megabyte page will be defined on the size your keys are. Right? If they're all 8-bit integers, then you can store a lot of them, uh, probably more, <laughs> more than you actually can have. Um, but for a fast SSD, Roughly 8 to 10 kilobytes is considered to be the, the right size. And then if you're in memory, 512 bytes is, is considered the right size because within a cache line, it, you can keep things very efficient. Right? We talked about the, the, that some systems can actually violate that requirement that every node has to be half full. Obviously, you can't go to more than, you, know, you can't have more keys than you can actually store because you run out of space. Um, but the you can recognize that, like, Okay, well, most the maybe I don't want to split, or so maybe, uh, yeah, maybe I want to merge my nodes all the time, um, and I can go below that threshold temporarily to see whether something's going to get, get inserted uh, to then put me above that threshold to avoid having to do this prematurely, right? So again, this is why Postgres is going to call their balance, or they call their B plus tree as a as a non balanced B plus tree. Um, because they, they can violate this, this requirement. Next question is, how do you want to handle variable length keys? Uh, I think somebody brought this up. So the, we could sort of try to pr approach it like a, like a column store. We want everything to be fixed length. Um, so one way to do that is actually you don't store the keys themselves in, in every node. You just store a pointer to the key, like the record ID, because um, that's always going to be either 32 bits or 64 bits. All right? And actually, this, this will save space too because you know if, if my keys are all really big, I'm not going to store them. You know, because again, the B plus tree is a copy of what's in the table. I only have to store the, just the pointer to the record ID in the in the in the, the nodes. Is that a good idea or a bad idea? It's, it's, he's right. He says it doesn't sound like a good idea because it causes a lot of non-sequential <laughs> I/O. Absolutely, yes. So think of it like as I'm traversing down my my nodes and I got to figure out whether I'm going to go left and right. I don't have those guideposts in my node. I got to go follow the pointer to go get that tuple uh, in that page. Then do the lookup to find what find what I need, right? And again, while I'm doing this, I'm holding latches in my data structure, and that's going to be really slow. Yeah. So nobody does this in a disk-based system. The the variant of this of a B plus tree is called T trees. Uh, I forget what the T stands for. I think it stands for the dude's name. Um, but they, in, the, in the diagrams, they, the, the nodes look like t Ts, but then I think the email, we said, oh, yes, yeah, the guy's name, but whatever. Um, In-memory databases did this in the 80s because they wanted to save space. You want to have duplicate keys in your, in your B plus tree because they didn't have a lot of memory. But again, nobody does this now in a real system because it, it's, it's so expensive to do that other lookup. It's, just, it's easier to just copy the key. You could support very, very length nodes. Um, where the size of the node can, can vary uh, within the index. And you have to do this because you don't know the size of the, the you want to have the same potential number of keys in every single node, but nobody has, uh, you, know, you, you may not have the, the, enough space to store all those keys within that node. Um, as far as I know, v only academic systems do this. Nobody does this in the real world. Padding is another approach to handle this, as we talked before in, in, in column stores. Again, I think this is rare. What most people do is that they would have a, essentially like a, like a almost like a slotted array, or a, a slotted page approach, like we saw in table note or table pages, where you just had this array of pointers within either offsets within the page you're looking at or to another overflow page. Um, 
right? And again, and it's it's how to say this? It's it's just like the overflow values we saw before, where you just you know you know that okay, the thing I'm looking for is not in my page. I got to go somewhere else and go get it. All right, now we got to talk about how we actually want to go find the keys. Once you know, once we land on the node, we bring it into memory, and we're looking for a key to decide to go left or right, or whether we have the match we're looking for in our leaf node. We got to decide how we're going to do does, do that match. So the easiest approach is just do a linear scan, right? Just think of like an array. Doesn't matter if it's sorted or not. I just start at the beginning and I scan along until I find the thing I'm looking for. In this case here, I'm looking for key eight. It's simple. It's dumb. It works, right? We can do a little better though with SIMD. Uh, actually, I don't. Who here is taking 418, 618? Nobody. Okay. So who here doesn't know what SIMD is? Okay, okay. SIMD stands for uh, Single Instruction and Multiple Data. It's a class of instructions you can have on modern CPUs that allow you to basically have like a vector register. You put a bunch of values in it, and then there's a single instruction to do like do something on it. Like you can put a bunch of numbers in one vector, a bunch of numbers in another vector, and do and add them together, and the output goes into another vector. We'll cover this when we talk about query execution. But this is a very common technique used in, in modern systems. This is what made Snowflake special 10 years ago. Right. So what I can do is instead of doing looking at every single uh, key one after another to try to find eight, I can instead use uh, uh, a SIMD intrinsic. In this case here, this is for x86 to do uh, evaluation for 32-bit integers on 128-bit uh, uh, registers. So I just stored the eight. I'm looking for eight. I store eight copies of eight in my SIMD register. It has four lanes. And then now in a single instruction, I can do an evaluation of those eight eight or four eights with the keys in my array, and then I'll get a bit mass that says uh, zeros if there's no match, one if there's a match. So in this case here, now it's a single instruction to do that evaluation, and I can do that way more efficiently than going one after another. In this case, and then for this one, I don't have a match, so I got to slide it over, do, do the look at the next one. I have to recognize that I only have three keys and not four, so I got to play little tricks to make sure like I don't end up with a false positive. But in this case here, now I have eight equals eight in that first lane, and I have a match. So I can do this more efficiently than doing this. It is still linear, but I'm doing it in batches, and the hardware can support that. Next approach is obviously do binary search. Right? Assuming it's sorted, this is easy. You jump in the middle. Uh, my value is greater than what I'm, the, 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 the key I land on is greater, less than the one I'm looking for. I jump to the next side and so forth until I find my match. Uh, then I'm done. This is what most systems will do. Yes? It depends on the heart. Like the heart. So in Postgres, it would be eight kilobytes, uh, okay. right? But again, the, the number of keys you can store in that node is going to depend on the key, what the, the type of the key is, right? So binary search is the most common one. The you could do this. I don't think any again outside of academia, nobody does this. Uh, you can do interpolation search, and this works if you know there's no gaps in your keys and they're always in monotonically increasing order. Like if you have a primary key that's a uh, like a like an auto increment value, like plus one plus one plus one plus one, uh, and again I assume I don't have any gaps, then it's just simple math to figure out exactly within my array. I know the low point, I know the, the min value, the max value, I the number I know the number of keys that I have, and I can just do a simple formula like this to jump exactly to the offset that I need, and I'm done. This is the fastest approach, faster than binary search, faster than SIMD, uh, but again you have you can't have gaps to do this. So it's rare. All right, we have, we have, what, 20 minutes left to get through all these optimizations. Let's see how far we can go, OK? Uh, some of these should be pretty obvious. The, uh, the, the pointer swizzling and the, and the buffer updates, those are, those are probably the most important. Dedupe 2. All right, so just like in a column store, we should recognize that the keys that are going to be in our, in, our, in our B plus tree, they're going to be in the same value domain because right, they're all coming from the same, same attributes. Furthermore, they're sorted, which is even better for compression. right? So there's a bunch of things we can take advantage of, recognizing that the values are going to be uh, very similar to, to reduce the size of, our, uh, of the keys we actually have to store. So in this case here, we can do what's called prefix compression. And we can identify that we're going to have a bunch of keys that are going to be very close to each other uh, in lexicographical ordering. And they're going to have overlapping uh, portions of, of data. So instead of storing complete copies of the keys, we just store the common prefix, in this case here, rob, and then we just store the, the remaining suffix that's, that's unique. Right? 
That's pretty easy. That's nice. Next technique is to do deduplication. And the idea here is that we're going to have uh, a bunch of keys that are end up with the, uh, the same value over and over again in the, uh, in the, in, in, in the same nodes. And again, ignoring the uh, prefix or putting the, uh, putting the record ID at the end, because that one, the system knows that it's doing that. It can pull that piece, piece out. But if I have a bunch of non-unique keys that are, that are going to end up in the same node, it's just like prefix sorting or prefix compression. I just store the, the duplicate key once, then have a, a, a posting list or a list of all the, the values that correspond to that key. And now I'm only storing one copy of that key. Right? Postgres added this in, um, I think, in, in, in Postgres 15. I think it came out last year. And it's a pretty significant drop in size of your, 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 your nodes. Yes? How are we going to know to interpret the bits that are to the right of V1 and the bottom of the table as V2 and not as K1? Yeah, so this question is how, how, do we know, how do we know that we should interpret what this is, like th th these are values, not keys? This is just a mock-up. You wouldn't actually store it. Like you, you, you wouldn't store it exactly in the page like this. You would have, obviously, lengths of the number of elements you're storing. I'm just not showing that. And you have additional metadata to know where the offsets are. We can also do suffix truncation. And again, because the inner nodes don't have to be the exact copies of the keys, because those keys might not exist in the leaf nodes, we maybe don't have to store the entire key. We just need enough of the, of the key keys prefix to discriminate whether we need to go left or right. So in this case here, I have keys A, B, C up to K, and then L, M, N, O up to, up to V. The only thing that, that really matters is, is, in this case here, is say just the first three characters of both of these two strings. So my inner nodes only need to store, store the minimum prefix uh, that we need to decide wh whether to go left or right. And of course, now the challenge is like if I Insert a key. Oops, sorry. Uh, if I insert a key that that could you know could be in between them, maybe I got to go back and get the original keys to, to decide what the prefix should be. Um, but in, in some environments, this this might be the right thing. All right. So pointer swizzling is a common technique that's going to allow us to minimize the, the amount of lookups we have to do in our buffer pools page table. Because again, when we are traversing the nodes, or traversing the tree structure, the what I keep calling our point as pointers, they're really page IDs. So I got to go to the page table and say, okay, well, if this page exists, give me give me the the, the pointer to it, right? So if I want to say find keys greater than three, I start my root node here, uh, and I I look at the keys and decide whether I want to go left and right. In this case here, I, I want to go uh, go left, but then the the value in, the, in this node here is going to be the page number, so page two. So now I've got to go down my buffer pool and say, OK, give me the, give me the, the pointer to page two. And likewise, when I'm on the bottom here, I want to scan along the sibling nodes. All right, I go from page two to page three. I've got to go back to the buffer pool. So a technique, the, the idea with pointer swizzling is that if you pin the page in the buffer pool, and say this page cannot be, cannot be evicted, then any any page that points to that page you pinned, you have to be pinned too, uh, you replace its contents with the actual pointer in memory. And so now when I'm, when I'm scanning, when I'm, you know, I'm traversing my tree, I'm not going to the buffer pool to say, go do this lookup for me for this page. I have the thing exactly what I'm looking for. So think of like the root node, everyone's always going to that in your B plus tree, and, say, and then they're always going to go down to the, the next level. So instead of having to do page, page lookups in the buffer pool, would get down to the next level, I have the pointer to know where, where to go directly. And obviously, you don't want to store this pointer on disk uh, you know, if the page gets flushed, because now you, you load it back in, you have this pointer that goes to nowhere, and that would be bad. So there's bookkeeping you have to do to make sure, OK, like, all right, you're, you're going to disk. Let me, let me undo this, this, this swizzle, what, what, what got swizzled, um, to make sure that nobody points to it. And, and then also, too, like, uh, uh, you don't want. You know, you don't want this page to get evicted. This thing have a swizzle pointer, and now it's pointing to some other page that got swapped in that frame, and doesn't, and, and it's not part of the B plus tree. And then you would have a seg fault because it starts interpreting bytes that it, that it should. It starts interpreting bytes in a way that it shouldn't. So the reason why I talk about this for the B plus tree and not for the hash table stuff or not for the regular heap stuff is because we already have this hierarchy. 
in our tree structure here, we would know that if we swizzle uh, anything below us, we want to make sure that this thing doesn't get uh, unpinned, sorry, that this thing doesn't get unpinned before its children get unpinned. And that way the pointers are always valid. Right? Just think again, when, you, when you're building project one, just think all the work you have to go do to go, go look up on the page table, go find the thing you're looking for, the frame's not there, and then you go evict something, right? You skip all of that. Uh, you know, the up update the LRUK stuff, right? You skip all of that by just going directly through the pointers. But of course, you lose the metadata of the access patterns for, for how these page pages are being used. But again, if it's important enough to, to pin it and swizzle it, then you probably should stay in memory. All right, to do uh, inserts quickly, the, the most common trick is just pre-sort everything, which we'll cover in, uh, I think, next week. Um, you sort all your keys. And just lay them out as leaf nodes, right, with your sibling pointers, and then build the, the data structure from the bottom to the top, right? And this is different than if I just do, if I just inserted the keys one after another, I would start from the top and go down and start having to do the, all the splits and so forth. I skip all of that, but just pre sort things and then and build the scaffolding on top of it, right? And th this technique is, is very common as well. All right, so the last optimization I want to talk about is, you know, we make a big deal about how the nice thing about the B plus tree is that it's balanced, everything's always log n, uh, and our lookups can be really fast because, again, it's gonna, we're gonna, everything's log n to get the leaf node, and then we can try to get as much sequential access, as sequential I.O. as we can. But, of course, the challenge is that updates are going to be expensive for us because we have to maintain this balance uh, this, this balance uh, property, anytime a thread comes along and inserts or deletes, they may draw the short straw and be responsible for reorganizing the entire data structure. And so ideally what we'd want is a way to delay the updates to the data structure in such a way that we can accumulate them. And then at some later point when we have enough, we say, okay, let me go ahead and apply all my changes in a batch. And then yes, I may have to reorganize things uh, but I'm doing it all at once. I can amortize the cost of, of, of making those changes. And now your writes could potentially be faster because you don't, you don't, you don't have to worry about, like, hey, I'm going to have to split every time I insert something new. So there's a line of work on what is called write-optimized B trees or B plus trees. Um, these have sometimes they're also called B epsilon trees. Um, you'll see it with the little, little epsilon symbol. Um, there's a commercial variant from the Tokutech guys called Fractal Trees, but it's, it's basically branding. It's, it's the same idea. Um, and the idea is basically now at every single uh, root node and inner node, I'm going to have a mod log, just like my Siegel had for their pages when they were doing compression. And any time a new update comes along, instead of propagating those changes all the way down to the leaf nodes, I'm going to violate the property we talked about in the B plus tree, uh, where the leaf nodes have to be where the actual values are, and I can insert my entries into the mod log. So if I want to insert seven, again, instead of having to traverse down and figure out where seven should go, I just put it in, in the root. Same thing, I, I want to delete, delete 10. Uh, instead of putting it into the, going down and deleting it and then potentially doing a, a merge, I'll just put it in, in the mod log. All right? So now if a query comes up and wants to find 10, well, as I traverse down, I look in, my, in the mod log and say, okay, is the thing I'm looking for here? So in this case here, I, I, I deleted 10. I, it's in my mod log. So when I do my lookup, I would find the entry here, and I'm done. I don't need to go to the bottom and, and to, you know, to actually see, see the change. Of course, what's the obvious problem with this? The buffers get full, right? So when that happens, then you've got to uh, cascade down the, the changes. And, but the idea is here you're doing this incrementally and in batches. And you, you basically you don't have to apply any modifications until you get like, to the structure of the data structure until you get to the, to, the, to the leaf nodes. So if I insert 40, I just move my previous changes, uh, insert 7, insert 10 here, uh, and, I, and, I, and I leave, uh, I put insert 40 there. And at some point, if I keep going, this thing, if th this thing cascades down, uh, and this thing gets full, then then I go ahead and apply my changes. Yes. Could this be 
potentially make reads really slow because you can build up this big buffer of operations and then you transform a read and it takes ages. Yeah, so the question is, could this potentially make reads go really slow because as I'm scanning along here, I potentially have to do sequential scans within the mod log to find to see the thing, whether the thing I'm looking for is in there. Yes, but then like these, these different systems, these different implementations of, of B epsilon trees, they'll have like bloom filters in front of these things to say, or is the key I'm looking for actually even in my mod log? If yes, then, then go look for it, All right? And bloom filters are, are cheap to, to maintain and, and they're not very big. So this is an old idea, that, I mean, old, 2003 old. Uh, B plus tree is 1972, so maybe that's not that old. Um, there's an old idea. This, what does this look also look like, before, what we talked about before, like log structure storage, right? Same idea that we can append these log, log entries uh, and then batch them up and then apply them uh, at some later point. So I, I said to you guys, we've seen this idea over and over again. So Toku Tech, they rebranded their implementation of a B epsilon tree as fractal trees. And then they had a storage engine for, for MySQL uh, that like, I think got, got by, bought by Bracona. And I think I got deprecated last year. So they had probably the most robust implementation uh, from, from a few years ago. That's dead. Um, SplinterDB is a key value store, embedded key value store from VMware. Um, written actually somebody here that it was, he's a, he was a researcher at VMware, but he was getting his, uh, his MBA here at, at Tepper at CMU. Um, and another guy working on this, he's now professor at Cornell. But like this is basically a, a, a sort of a super optimized version of, of, of this. And then relational AI is a uh, relational knowledge based a sort of graph veneer on top, not graph, knowledge graph veneer on top of a relational database system that uh, implements B epsilon trees to do fast updates. So this is not that common, uh, but uh, you know, this is something I, I suspect we'll see more and more of uh, in the future. I mean, RocksDB doesn't need this because RocksDB already is a log structure merge tree, and you're you're, you're essentially getting this, the same idea, the same the same uh, the same properties. All right. So we have six minutes left. So let's pop up in Postgres and do a quick demo. So here I'm going to I'm going to demonstrate the difference between um, let me turn the lights off. The dem demonstrate the difference between MySQL or sorry not MySQL. Uh, nope. Nope. Sorry. Let's do that. Oh, that's even worse. There we go. All right. Sorry, I had to write the first time. So I want to demonstrate the difference between a uh, a hash index and a and a B plus tree on uh, on on data, and then we, we can see what the database system is going to choose uh, to to use to to run queries. So the data set I'm going to use is going to be uh, I think it's 21 million email addresses um, from a few years ago, right? Because it's all on, um, it's all on the internet. Yeah, so what, 27, 27 million email addresses, right? And so I'm not going to run this in, in real time, but I've basically I've created two indexes. Uh, I created one here on, on a B plus tree on the emails. Oops, sorry. And the way it works is like in Postgres, you say create index uh, with the name of the index on this table, and then using, and then you can specify what data structure you want. So by default, if you don't have the using clause in Postgres, you, you, you get a B plus tree. But here, I'm explicitly telling you I want a B plus tree. And it, the, the index already exists, so I don't need to do that. Um, and then I have the build the same thing on, on the same column. I'll build it on a, on a, using a hash table, and I just say using hash. And again, I already have that. So let me turn off a bunch of other optimizations in Postgres. That we don't need to worry about just yet, right? So I can do queries like this, right? Select min email from emails, and I get some some random thing like this. But again, if I put the explain keyword in front of it, Postgres will, will tell me what the query plan is, right? So here it's going to tell me I want to do an index only scan using the B plus tree, uh, and it tells me what the conditional conditional is. Um, so we didn't talk about the index only scan. It's sometimes called cover scans or covering indexes. Basically, Postgres recognizes that all the data or all the columns I need to answer this query can be found in the index. So even though they're storing the, the record IDs in the leaf nodes, 
I don't need to actually follow those record IDs to get the data for the actual tuple. All everything I need for this query can be answered from the from the index, right? Because again, going back to my my query, it was just select the min email from uh, from from the email address and the index is on email. So once I go all the way to to the right side of the tree or yeah left side of the tree, that has all the data I'm looking for, right? So that's why it told me it can do an index only scan. So that's fine. So let's see now if we want to do something like this. We want to say, give me give me all the emails where uh, the the first letter is A, but I'm do a, I do a limit one, and you get so many like this. Um, and I can do explain to see what it actually tells me to what to do. So in this case here, Postgres says, even though I have an, I have that B plus tree index that is sorted on emails, Postgres decides it wants to do a sequential scan because it recognizes that the thing I'm looking for, uh, you know, I'm looking for all all emails that start with A, that's at some middle point in the tree, uh, and since it's unbounded, I'm not specifying like, um, at least in the scan size, I'm not specifying the end marker. It would say, oh, okay, you got to scan to the entire end. Now it's not smart enough to recognize I have a limit one there, right? So what it really should have done is just probe down the index, find the first thing, and then popped out and done. But in this case here, Postgres wasn't wasn't smart enough to figure that out, right? And it can't p pick the hash index because, again, I'm doing like a wildcard search. I don't have the the, the actual full key. Right, so you can see you can see this in other ways, right? So so in this case here, I want to find all emails where it's uh, greater than Andy. Again, it relies decides to do a sequential scan. But now if I do something like this, find all emails where oops, find all emails where the the, the first letter sorry the, the 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 string starts with ZZZ. Now I'm on the right side of the tree, and Postgres recognizes based on the distribution. Okay, well you're far enough along the tree where I'm going to scan along. So it's okay for me to do the index scan because that's still going to be that's going to be less data than doing a complete sequential scan, right? And at no point did Postgres decide to use the hash index because again, I'm doing like less than, greater than, or wildcard matches. So we can do something like this, where now we can say, uh, for you know, find emails where there's exact quality matches using the in clause, and now you see Postgres decides to use the the hash index here, right? Uh, the bitmap index scan. I'll explain what that is. It's not what you. It's not a real bitmap index. Um, you actually you can see it better with if you, instead of using in, you can use a bunch of ors, right? And now what you see is that Postgres has multiple entries where it's gonna, where, for the index scan, where for each of the each of the email addresses I had in, in that in my where clause, like you know something equals something or something equals something, each of those are going to be a separate probe into the hash index. And then they maintain a bitmap of the, I think it's the actual tuple IDs, the tuple offsets, not the, not the pages. They maintain a bitmap of the matching values for each of those index probes, and then they OR them up together, and then that produces the exact tuples they actually, you actually you'd actually would need. And this is sort of similar to what I was saying before, where you, you figure out what the pages you need from the, from, the, from the index first, then go actually and go get them. So they're doing that here. They're doing a bunch of probes in the index. Don't actually get the real data from the, two, the tables. Do the OR on the bitmaps. Then you have the list of the, of the indexes you, or list of the records you actually need to go get. Right? Okay. So um, the next thing I want to do is talk about clustering tables. So Postgres doesn't act. So Postgres supports the cluster command, but it doesn't actually, and it will sort your table. But it doesn't actually maintain the sorting because it because it's not going to be organized. It's not index organized. So you so with the cluster command, Postgres will sort your data. But as you start modifying the table, it can get out of sorted of order. So I'm not going to do this live because it would take too long. Uh, and I realize we're a little over time. But like the command would be basically like this, right? You would say cluster the table you want to cluster, uh, and then what the index you want to be have it be clustered on. So I this takes a in about a minute to run, so I've already run it before we class, so I'm not going to do that. But we can go look at like what's in the first, the first, uh, the first page. So again, the CTID is the record ID and offset in Postgres. So you do that. Uh, that does not look. Well, that actually that's the unsorted one. So that looks all random. But if I change the name of the table to clustered. Because uh, of that, sorry.
right? Now you see that in the first page of the first offsets, the, 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 the tuples are actually sorted in that order, right? Based on, based on the index. So if I go ahead and delete one of these entries, I delete the very first person uh, and their fake email address, and I can now go back and do the same scan on the table, right? Postgres didn't fill in that, that first slot, right? It's, it's empty. But now if I insert this fake person back in and do the same scan, right, they're still not in that first page, right? So to go find them, we do select star, select CTID from emails clustered, where email equals this, right? Now they're in page 299. I don't know where that is, some random thing. But it's again, it's not in sorted order. Because again, Postgres can't maintain the sort order because uh, it doesn't have true clustered indexes. OK. So uh, B plus trees are important. It's probably the best choice for, for your, if your database system. Tries are pretty good. Uh, you can have B plus trees of tries, as I said before. Um, but B plus tree is there's a bunch of ways of optimizing it faster. So next class, we'll talk about how do you actually make your B plus tree thread safe by traversing down and even when you're doing splits and merges. OK? Hit it. This shit is gangsta. Gangsta. That boy's a gangsta. Yeah, ain't nothing but gangsta. Yeah, yeah. Now listen, I'm the poppy with the motherfucking hookup. 28 a gram, depending on if it's cook up. You ain't hit a mob yet? Still got you shook up? I smack you with the bottom of the clip and tell you, look up. Show me where the safe's at before I blow your face back. I got a block on taps, the feds can't trace that. Style is like Tampa proof, you can't lace that. The Dominican, or you could call me Dominican. Black skelly, black leather, black suede Timberlands. My all black 38 will send you to the pearly gates. You get consignment trying to skate, and that's your first mistake. I ain't lying for that cake, your fam, I see you wake. My grams is heavyweight, then ran through every state. When they ask me how I'm living, I tell them I'm living great.